While the world economy suffers badly from the global financial crisis, China shows a good sign of growth in many areas. In particular, investors from China have been actively seeking outbound investment opportunities, buying up technology, resources, brands to bring them back to the domestic market. Despite the economic slowdown, China has nevertheless tripled the value of outbound M&A deals in the first half of 2012. And it is very similar from the inbound perspective. Despite the economic slowdown again, we see continuous interest in corporate expansion into China to tap into the great consumer potential. Li Keqiang recently made a speech commenting that China should stop relying on demographic dividend, i.e. exporting cheap labor, and instead turn towards reform dividend, in other words, developing the domestic market. For this reason, China remains a very, very attractive market for foreign investors and corporates. And for these reasons, we feel that China is playing a very important role and will be continue playing a very important role in the global market. So we're now at a very interesting point in history. And before we start our discussions and presentation today, I invite all of you to think about two numbers before we start. Firstly, the $195,000 billion of wealth that has been generated so far. We know, as a matter of fact, that most was made after the year 1800. We also know, as a matter of fact, that most was made and is now owned by the West. Secondly, the year of 1776. Firstly, by the United States of America. And secondly, more importantly, Adam Smith published the Wealth of Nations. And he then made a very fine Observation, I quote it. China seems to have long been stationary and, probably long ago, acquired the full complement of riches, which is consistent with the nature of its laws and institutions. But this complement may be much more inferior to what the other laws and institutions, the nature of its soil, climate, and situation might have been on. A question I guess we should all ask ourselves here today is that how far can China reach and what should be changed in the household in order to reach that? And on that note, as John Yan has quoted, the soil of China and the institutions, the institution is actually limiting its capacity and what really pops to mind quite quickly would be the rule of law issue. And we are thus very honored today to have Mr. Rico Chan, Head of Baker McKenzie, China Hong Kong Property Department, Mr. Dennis Kwok, Member of the Hong Kong Legislative Council, and Professor Benny Tai, Associate Professor of the Law Faculty of Hong Kong U, to join us today discussing the topic of rule of law. Would the three of you please kindly proceed to the stage? Uh, I see Rob being probably a, a very 
very uh, basic, largest common denominator of what we're doing. But whatever the practice area you're in, uh, we are a player, we are practitioner in the legal system. All of us, every day in our work, are contributors, contributors or contributors uh, this legal system uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the aspiration of global law. So, uh, and this talk also much. Uh, I think um, after so many years of practice, I realized actually I know very little about it. Um, I, I want to know more about it. I am a student of it. So uh, I, I guess a lot of us also, and you heard some of you guys know better I mean, since the law school, the first time you're studying uh, law and society to the first person, etc. But uh, uh, you, soon you realize that after you have been acting active practice for a number of years, you start kind of forgetting about what, what it's all about, although you are in the system day in, day out. So that's the background of why we suggest it's good to have this uh, session. And uh, um, before I kind of go to the, um, uh, the substantive panel discussion, uh, may I could just mention one other, uh, I know one other person, which is Mandy Lam, uh, here, uh, is in the front row. Uh, Mandy is a uh, qualified lawyer in Australia, born in Taiwan, qualified in Australia, qualified in the US, and she has been a pro bono and research associate of the project. And the material in front of you today is a blue sheet um, uh, that is a, 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 a production by uh, Mandy, uh, uh, collecting some of the research material for those of you who are interested in looking in, looking in this area a bit further. So um, here, what I propose to Mandy, and then I, I suggest that we do this. Uh, we will, the session will be about approximately 45 minutes, but it's pretty short, and uh, it will be very beneficial for all the talk to us uh, after the tech coffee break. And then uh, within 45 minutes, uh, roughly, we will have about 15 minutes of our uh, discussion, and then we will have uh, 15 minutes for uh, the audience. So uh, on, on that, uh, I probably will start with, uh, I will, during the next session, I probably will do uh, sort of, uh, to enable the panelists on, on three levels. One is on a conceptual level, and then on a on the China scene, since it's a group of China discussion. Uh, of course, we also discuss Hong Kong, and then at a personal level. Um, so, if I may start with uh, Ben, um, I think uh, uh, in, the, in the paper I distributed uh, in sort of the study, uh, uh, many and I are doing, uh, we realize that they are actually probably uh, a worldwide, a medical uh, conceptualization or a description of global world concept. And uh, you are one of the uh, very uh, well-known uh, uh, academic uh, who has uh, a sort of whole idea about this. And uh, in, the, in this paper, uh, 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 the, the audience, you see that there are four or five uh, different uh, uh, descriptions. And uh, in this case, I would invite uh, uh, Benny to describe some of you in, in, in your uh, thinking, <coughs> how do you how do you how do you see the that as a subject of this? Okay, thank you, Rick. And also, thank you for, for the organizers of inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, all of you are law students. I think you have studied law, and you might have studied about local law. And, um, but I think most of you, if you have studied about local law, the group of law theory is uh, mainly kind of uh, influenced by Western uh, societies of Western legal systems experiences. And um, the group of theories could be divided two kinds you know, under the Western ideas, so called the theme theory or the fake theory. The theme theory we see that through uh, law mainly as a tool that is to ensure that everyone follows the law and that is it. And the fake theory will, will require that the law must uh, achieve a certain um, kind of uh, of, of providing certain kind of protection to fundamental rights, that's the fake theory. But this, um, the prevailing uh, theories of law law in the West still based it very much on the Western experience. And those theories are also developed after the Western world has achieved it, law law. So that when they look back, okay, then they see that this is the law law requirement. But, um, as I research on the rule of law, and uh, especially in countries without a Western tradition, or maybe so-called in the developing world, that uh, they are in the process of building or developing rule of law. This kind of uh, rule of law theories on the West may not be too helpful, because the rule of law theories of the West 
is a kind of yes or no kind of field. According to, they may have, a, as I say, the thick or the thin theory, they may have a different kind of status required. So, according to their theories, that they set a certain criteria. If you have those criteria, you have to vote. If you do not have those criteria, you do not have to vote. This is a kind of yes or no theory. Now, but for the, but for the developing world, they are in the process of building up, unlike the Western, Western societies. Actually, the Western societies have also undergone hundreds of years to develop the global system they have. So, on the basis of that, um, putting a certain kind of developmental element into the global theories, actually it's not really a new theory, but incorporating the Western theories, but adding the uh, developmental kind of dimension into it. So, uh, on, the, on, the, on the sheet you can see that the theories that I put forward there's a, a four level or four stages of uh, growth law. Starting from the existence of law, without law, you cannot have growth law, but there's not any kinds of law that you would say qualify the requirements of growth law. There are some qualitative requirements for law to be laws under growth law. And uh, if you have studied jurisprudence, you must have heard uh, of uh, Fuller's uh, book, uh, The Morality of Law. And in the book, uh, Fuller suggested eight different requirements for uh, he called the inner morality law. So I think that's the kind of uh, requirement for any law to qualify as laws in a global system. You need to satisfy those uh, requirements. So that's the first level. Making laws may not make you a global system, but making laws that can satisfy those requirements, then you, you have the first level. That's the existence of law. Then the second level of the rule of law is that regulation by law. The, the sovereign or the uh, government determined to use law to rule. I think that's very basic. Making the law, if it's just put on a shelf, there's no meaning. But you, you, you really want to practice the law and use the law to rule. Now, but in, re, in reality, many systems, they may commit themselves that we're going to use law to rule. But in reality, that it actually officials didn't pay much attention to the law. And so we have to move beyond the regulation by law to the third level. I think that's also making the law uh, unique, is that it's limitation from law, that the law imposed limitations on governmental powers. By granting powers to officials, but at the same time, limiting the powers of the government. That's the third level, limitations on law. And the, at the final level, the highest level, is a justice through law. But at the end, law is to serve justice, protecting fundamental rights, social justice. So, using this um, uh, four levels or four stages of law, law then we can, it, it's, if we put this theory to uh, developing world, we can then see how they could progress their, uh, um, in the development of law, law from no law, law to existence of law to regulation by law, to limitations of law, and then to justice through law. So we can see the progress. And also we can use this theory to, to assess the development of a particular legal system. Actually, I, I, I just back from Hunan, um, the Hunan University just organized a conference on the uh, assessment of law. law. And, and I was a keynote speaker in that conference. And the conference, actually, we have looked at how we could develop a, a kind of a mechanism to allow us to measure and assess the performance of a particular legal system so as to tell how, how far it has progressed in the development of law. I may talk more about the situation in China later, but, but I think that's the kind of a conceptual framework we can use uh, other than just using the Western theories, the yes or no theories, we have a theory that can look at the development. I think that's a very important point, especially for developing world, that how we could develop the growth law from zero to a high level of growth law. Uh, so uh, on that note, uh, if I may invite that, uh, Dennis, as a, as a politician, 
and it was a legal recognition at the same time. Uh, and you have some uh, primary in Hong Kong, but they also have some primary in Hong Kong in China as well. Uh, on the TPA scale of sales before, how do you rank how do you rank Hong Kong and China and in China? What, what cost do you make there? You're asking me as a politician or as a practitioner? <laughs> <laughs> Should be the same. Um, I, I, I uh, have been reading uh, Benny's analysis of the four stages of the rule of law and have been reflecting it uh, for, for uh, a number of years, reflecting on it. And, uh, and if you ask me what is the general status of the rule of law in, in China, I would say we are slowly, probably slowly approaching stage two. Uh, I think we are approaching uh, in the whole, in, in the greater China. And whereas in Hong Kong, I think we are approaching and have been approaching in the past decade or so to stage four. Uh, we have certainly reached stage three, Yi Fa Han Tu. Stage four, Yi Fa Da Yi. I think in the past decade or so, in Hong Kong especially, uh, we've seen a lot of judicial reviews, uh, the rise in the number of judicial reviews concerning uh, social justice, what is right. Uh, uh, we're asking courts more and more to uh, rule on issues that are not, perhaps not strictly legal in the sense, but also uh, it concerns in, in society how, uh, uh, where, where resources should be, how it should be distributed, whether it is right, in, for example, in an environmental case, uh, whether it is right for a, a developer or a development to go ahead without uh, uh, regarding, having due regard to the uh, 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 protection of public health. That sort of issues are the kind of cases that are, I think taking Hong Kong to stage four uh, uh, of the development of the rule of law. Perhaps I, I, should, I should also tell you something about myself because I share a very similar background to all of you. I also graduated from the University of London. I went, I went to King's College London myself. I graduated in 1999 and after graduation I came back to do my PCLL in Hong Kong U and then I started my training contract with a UK firm. Uh, and then it was five years after uh, having been a solicitor I switched to the bar because I wanted to go into politics uh, and also I want to develop more of a practice in human rights law and judicial review etc. I, I went into politics very much because of the rule of law in Hong Kong. I believe the rule of law is not something that you can take for granted, especially not in Hong Kong. Unfortunately, I say this un unfortunately, if you look at most other uh, uh, modern sort of Western democracy, rule of law is not very much a political issue. It is an issue. It is something that people take for granted that you would expect government officials, most of the time anyway, to take the rule of law as something which one cannot uh, disregard. Uh, in Hong Kong, I believe most officials, most government officials, most people who are practicing in the, in the, in the, in the law, uh, judges, uh, and most Hong Kong citizens have a very firm concept of the rule of law and has high respect for it. And so Hong Kong's rule of law, I, I still believe, is in a very healthy state, and it is getting better by, in, in a number of ways. Uh, we're doing much better, I think, in, 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 in terms of maintaining our rule of law, running our court system, our judicial system, better even than the days before the handover, in some ways, I would say. Uh, but is it something that we can take for granted? No, because we are, we are uh, um, living under one country, two system. Our rule of law is sustained by the basic law. Uh, and uh, we're living in a nation of 1.3 billion people, where in most parts, the concept of the rule of law and respect of the rule of law is pretty weak. And uh, their concept of the rule of law is actually, in, in, in quite a number of fundamental ways, quite different from the way we see the rule of law. Uh, and but the, the root law and the independence of the judiciary, our civil rights as guaranteed under the basic law is so fundamental to Hong Kong's society that without it, I would say that Hong Kong will no longer be able to maintain that special status, that advantage that, that we have as, as a city, as a special administrative region. 
So I think all of you uh, really has an important role to play. If, if you've decided to join the legal profession to, after you, you, you finish your studies in the UK and you've decided to come back, I think you will be looking at making a real difference in not only helping Hong Kong's rule of law to live on, uh, to giving it a future, but you are also keeping the hope that one day when, the, when our country, when our nation is ready to change towards the direction of developing a true uh, sense of the rule of law and developing uh, independent judiciary, when the country is ready to change, what we have here in Hong Kong, what you will help maintain and to make it live on, will be able to change uh, the rest of the nation. So what we do here as a member of the legal profession has tremendous impact for China in the 21st century. So it is not a duty, it's not something that that uh, one, one take on lightly. And whether you go into a big law firm, you do property law or M&A, or you go into university, or you become a barrister, you all have a role to play. And um, as Rico said, um, he's a property partner, has been so for the past 20 years, and he's deeply concerned about the state of the rule of law. Because without it, our, our practice as a lawyer, frankly, will, will go down the drain. So not only we have our self-interest to protect as lawyers, we have the destiny of Hong Kong and the, the China and the future of the rule of law in our nation, in our hands, being simply being members of the legal profession. So, you know, I, I hope that most of you, after you graduate, will decide to come back and join the legal profession in Hong Kong. It is a great place, and still, there are still many opportunities, and you will you'll have a, a, a really exciting time ahead of you, and I really hope all of you would, uh, would, would consider that. But on that note, um, I, I'll leave it to, to existing. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah, uh, just to uh, make it more concrete, uh, I'll ask for the citizens. So, listen to what you said. I did a, lot, a number of points, and I will come back to that uh, maybe in 10 seconds. It sounds like uh, your, your, your rating for Hong Kong is like 3.6. <laughs> uh, yeah, somewhere around. That. Okay, <laughs> your rating for Hong Kong, China is 1.9 or 2.3. What? <laughs> I, I think we're still below the two. Thank you so much. Well, uh, I, I think I'm uh, usually a more than a uh, professor. Then I'll uh, at least say 2.5 for China. That is approaching three. Actually, it's, uh, my assessment, China is actually at the bottom end. China, since 79, have enacted a lot of laws. Uh, even though some of the laws may not satisfy the requirement of uh, the basic qualities, Laws are little goal, but I think it's uh, the level one surely achieved it. Um, I think the new general secretary of the uh, Communist Party, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, recently mentioned many times that uh, anti-corruption is something core to the new uh, leadership. Um, but the problem is that how could they achieve that? And up to this point, what he has mentioned is still relying on the uh, personal um, um, kind of uh, virtues of the government. So they are very clear that they commit to use law to rule. That's in the constitution of the People's Republic of China. But because of the one-party rule, they are still not willing to move beyond the level two. So I think it's now at a point of bottleneck. And what we can observe in the coming five to ten years, how this new leadership can achieve what it has promised. They promised to counter corruption. How could they counter corruption without separating the powers, without checking the powers? Now, if they could do that, well, that may be really a China model. But I doubt that that could be achieved. This is based on observation of human nature. That's Chinese, I think, not too different from people in the West. That um, if you just rely on the individual uh, uh, persons and their own virtue, then I think that not much could be achieved. Even though that may be the highest ideal. The highest ideal that I think the confusion is the uh, highest ideal is that it's not because you are being commanded to do, it's because of your own commitment. Now, that's, that's the highest ideal. But we do not have that many sacred uh, persons 
in China or in human society. So it has to be a kind of a, a, a kind of a, a big thing before you could really be able to do that. Now there may be one or two things in the generation, but we have uh, we need hundreds and, and, and thousands of officials to run the government. That may be one or two things. Maybe uh, Premier Wen Jiabao is a thing. Oh, is a thing. Someone <laughs> saying, saying it's more a, an actor rather than the thing. But uh, but maybe maybe Xi Jinping is the same also. But we could not rely on a thing to rule. One thing to rule. We have thousands. We need thousands, hundreds, and thousands of officials. We could not expect that all of them to be same. So therefore, on the basis of human nature. I think so. My theory is not a, a very idealistic theory. It's a very practical theory based on the human nature, and that's also how the Western society developed a global system, understanding the, the 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 dark side of the human nature, and so they have to develop systems to ensure that official power is given, power is not corrupt. Uh, you, you oh, um, surely Hong Kong situation, uh, we are beyond that uh, limitation control. That uh, we have all these uh, systems to ensure that government officials are uh, uh, bound by law. And also we have the Bill of Rights and, and we have achieved the protection of fundamental rights. But I agree with that is that um, actually the global law foundation of Hong Kong is a bit flimsy because of the one country, two systems issue. And um, now, that is maybe a bit too limited to Hong Kong. I think you are also very much involved in the recent uh, controversy. The, our SJ now applying for, or re make a request to our court to make a referral to the standing committee. Now this issue uh, is in a way threatening Hong Kong's global law. Not, oh, not, not, not talking about just as we wrote that level, actually is touching on some very foundational issues at the level three of limitations of law. Um, I will not elaborate more on that point, but uh, I would say that uh, yes, we have achieved, but because in 2005, I conducted a survey on the uh, rule of law in Hong Kong, basically using my, my theory, and um, the assessment in 2005, in 2005, was not good because that was uh, no. I should say it's good, but that's a declining trend at that time. 2005, 2005. At that time, the secretary, uh, the secretary for justice, was El Zira. and then after that, uh, Wong Yen Long became our secretary for justice. I think in general we could have a better uh, hope and better uh, uh, kind of trust that our global law would be in better in in, in a pair of good hands. Unfortunately, now we have a new SJ, and unfortunately, he was my classmate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, under the new SJ, and with, actually, without his recent comments, I will not make that kind of uh, saying, but, but uh, from his recent comments concerning the making of referral, I'm a bit disappointed. So, I'm a bit worried about the referral in Hong Kong. At least, um, in the area can't change the relationship with the central government. Now that would be the area. And actually more than that, actually, if you look at the recent controversy concerning domestic cultures, concerning the Brown Group, actually it's not related to anything with the mainland China. But the the uh, new administration under Xi Le and Ripsky Yu, they are prepared to, I say, sacrifice some of our rule of law in order to resolve the reputable problem. Maybe that's a problem, but I think that could be better methods to resolve using methods that are compatible with the growth law to solve, like amending the basic law. But I think because of the one country two system, China say no, no amendment. So we have we are forced to use some methods that will say not too much compatible with a higher level of growth law. Uh, it may be it may be uh, uh, set aside the, the lower level requirements, but may not set aside the higher requirements of growth law. It's a bit unfortunate. I will, uh, I, I, I will say for myself, I, I, I echo the concern, and it's actually uh, the reason that I actually 
a few others who started me sort of look more concerned of what I call further in school. And now we are so I'm um, I'm up for uh, uh, for better time uh, in Hong Kong we are developing a Europe low education project, but we can come back to that uh, 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 later. But yeah, I, I also say that in Hong Kong. Now moving to China and uh hurry up with my tendency to say things that I have heard say a little bit of myself experience as a practitioner and then come back to the Now if we uh, focusing on China uh, and I think uh then you have some particular involvement with the China program in the right uh, perspective. Yeah. If you were to say uh, one or two things that are sort of not really positive about I mean it's not all bad, uh, it's not all bad, it's not all good. But if you have to name one or two things that come to mind that is you, you say it's not worth positive development and one or two really kind of concerning shortcoming or, or uh, setback, what would be those? Which one? Sure. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll start with um, why, uh, I mean, Benny mentioned, uh, if I just finish off uh, Benny's uh, comment on the interpretation of the basic goal by the National People's Congress Standing Committee, which is a recent controversy, if, if you've been following the news in Hong Kong. Uh, I think what happened, the, 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 the issue there is not only just a clash of system, because here in Hong Kong we have the separation of powers, we believe in the independence of the judiciary. Whereas in in, in, uh, in Central People's Government's perspective, uh, the National People's Congress ought to be the uh, highest uh, lawmaking body and has the power to interpret laws. Uh, and from their point of view, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's not only a clash of system, but it's a clash of values. And that's the reason why we can't take the rule of law for granted in, in Hong Kong. And I say this because especially of my work in the China Human Rights Lawyers uh, uh, area, uh, I'm a member of the China Human Rights uh, Lawyers Concern Group in, in Hong Kong, and we are a group which provides support uh, to human rights lawyers who are doing human rights cases on the front line in China. And it's not a line of work that you want to take lightly. Uh, it involves uh, a personal danger, danger to your family, your license, your practice could be taken away without notice, and it is a tough area to be working in. But there are increasing number of lawyers in China who are willing to take up human rights and cases that involve uh, going up against the government authorities uh, in the more rural parts of China where, where um, it is not uh, an, an easy task to do. Uh, unfortunately, I, I say this because um, I've been working with, with them for a number of years and, and I, unfortunately, in the past five years or so, we've seen a backlash in the terms of the uh, respect for the rule of law and human rights in China. We've seen that uh, human rights lawyers, not only themselves, but their clients are being treated much more brutally in the past five years or so. So it, it, although the legal infrastructure in China, as Benny said, is there, all the laws are there, the courts are there, the courts are actually built very in, in very nice buildings, uh, judges are, are, you know, uh, there are plenty of judges, but the, the spirit of the rule of law, the respect for the rule of law and human rights are still not there, uh, are still quite lacking. Um, and the question uh, still being asked today in China is whether human rights, whether the concept of the rule of law, as we know it, is a universal concept. Thus China has an exception. Thus human rights, the concept of human rights, does it apply to China, uh, the rule of law? And there's still that question. If you ask me, I think that's a false question. The rule of law and human rights are universal concepts, universal values that are applicable wherever you are. Um, I, I once had a conversation with someone who was jailed uh, in China for five years for doing human rights work. And I asked him this question. He's Chinese. Uh, do you think human rights is a universal concept applicable even in China? And he told me this. He said, if you're put into jail, uh, have your freedom stripped away, uh, you've taken away from your family, your assets, your career taken away from, from all of you, uh, from, from you. Uh, and you're, you're lying in the cell in the middle of the night. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are Chinese, Indian, uh, Westerner, Russian, whatever, the feeling you have would be the same. And that is why human rights is universal. Because the sense of injustice felt by a person is not restricted or, or uh, any different because of your skin color. I, I think that 
uh, speaking from uh, his first-hand experience uh, as a human rights lawyer, I think um, that answers the question of whether human rights or the rule of law is a universal value. It must be, a, the, the answer must be resounding yes. And, but every time I, I go to China, I think that uh, Rico asked me to say something good, positive, and very Oh, absolutely. Uh, is when, whenever I meet students, law students and uh, professors in the law faculties, in Beijing University, Wuhan, I'm going up to Wuhan next month, uh, Every time I go meet, meet them, I see the real hole in the universities, the law students. And they really understand, it's not difficult to understand that. They really understand the rule of law, they understand the importance of the in, independent judiciary, and they understand why the rule of law is important for the development of the nation. And these people, when they graduate, they will go into the legal profession, they will go and become judges or some of the government officials. They are the hope and the future of China's rule. And I think that's... I, I totally agree with uh, Dennis' observation about the new generation. Um, actually, I've mentioned I just visited Changsha uh, Hunan, uh, and I had the chance to uh, talk with the students. I've given a lecture uh, on the global institution, the global culture, the students talking about all these global issues. And I totally agree that they, they are very receptive on the uh, idea of global. And uh, though, we know that there are limitations at this stage. That under the present uh, kind of government structure, the Chinese Communist Party, that uh, maybe it may take some time for the change. But I think we agree that change will come. There will be a time change will come, and uh, it may rely on the the people's commitment or understanding to the rule of law. And um, I think this, this kind of change is also irresistible. As in my research, looking into the, the developmental theory of rule law, that uh, actually this development is also under the influence of globalization. And, and China, through the process of modernization and globalization, I think it's irresistible. The change will come. But just that the question is, how, for how long that the Chinese Communist Party can delay such a change. The, uh, my, my, my observation is that the longer the delay, the, the higher cost they have to pay in the future. So for a very rational choice of the Chinese Communist Party, it is to make the change as early as possible. That's a very rational choice. But politics is sometimes not rational. Okay? So politics, talking about interest, talking about all kinds of, uh, of power things, and maybe they may not make rational choices. Okay? But in the long run, for survival, the Chinese Communist Party also need to, I would say, that make the rational choice. Would it be this uh, leadership? The Xi Jinping leadership will be for ten years, or would it be? After that, and I may be a bit uh, kind of uh, optimistic as well as pessimistic. I am optimistic that change will come. Pessimistic is that the change may need uh, 10 years, 20 years time to come. But here you are here, 10 years or 20 years from now, you will be the, 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 the pillars of the uh, uh, Chinese uh, society, taking the break to China. And you may play a key role in that change of China. And, uh, I think that's important. And, and surely, together with the students in mainland China. And um, because the, the cultural change, I can already see that. Institutions relate with the culture. When the culture change, the institution must change. China, the Chinese people, throughout these years of modernization, with its exposure to the outside world, impact of globalization, you can sense, you can see the cultural change within China. With the ch change in the culture, the institution must change. That's just that's why I say it's resistant. That's not just out of a kind of wishful thinking. It is more based on the observation of the uh, development of 
institutions throughout the world, not limited to uh, legal institutions. Okay. Um, actually, quite just a point, I, I think I've heard what the scrap of the third half, I heard a little bit of the third half. Just finally? Okay. So I'll uh, write. Um, uh, the organizer asked me to at least say something from a practice perspective. I'll be very brief and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give it open to the floor. Um, and then, no good you decide how much more time we need to do this. Five minutes or something like that. Now, uh, I, as a Chinese practitioner uh, uh, in Hong Kong, I did a bit of I would tell you that um, the Chinese court uh, system does, uh, does work yes. uh, whenever we can do it at the moment. We just try to avoid it. We try to do arbitration and next time we'll talk about that as well. Uh, but we also have good experience. We have a very challenging case which was decided uh, not only in our country, but I think decided to the right way. So we are plus and minus. But uh, whenever we sort of uh, uh, expose the Chinese law as a practitioner and our client, we will be every, every minute of the, of the case. So it is a When you are going for Hong Kong court, I think the of China, the Hong China solicitor, the Hong Kong solicitor, practitioner, prime minister, you, you, you think you have a fair day in the court. You have that confidence. But you don't have that confidence in time. So uh, with that, uh, I will uh, invite if there's any uh, uh, any any audience would like to ask our panelists uh, questions. Yeah, please don't be shy and ask questions. C. J. Ma, inside his recent visit to Oxford University, suggested another test for the rule of law. He suggested that it is, in essence, um, a sense of perception that the um, best test, according to him, is to put all the lawyers inside a bar, get them drunk, and then ask them whether you think there, there's a rule of law. Now, if we apply this test to Beijing and Hong Kong, what would be the answer? <laughs> Well, I, I cannot tell, I cannot tell, but um, I actually have many chance to uh, have dinners with uh, lawyers, professors, uh, um, after they have drank, drank, <laughs> drank something, <laughs> whether drunk or not, I'm not sure. But um, I think my impression that um, in the academia and, uh, and also some lawyers, um, they see the importance of the rule of they see that China is not yet, according to the terms, not yet having rule of law. Even though, according to my theory, I would say they have some rule of law, but not a uh, very high level of rule of law. But they would say that, no, we do not have rule of law in China yet. Um, lawyers are a bit, bit more practical than, than academic. Academics may see more hope than, or willingness to change or willingness to, to put effort in changing the thing. But the petitioners, petitioners may be more concerned about their kind of business. So they may accept the reality a bit more. So Rico is very like exceptional person. <laughs> As a petitioner and you're still very keen to about uh, Roblo. Um, so that's my, my observation. So um, yes uh, they have really drank some amount of oil. Okay, after the <laughs> well, in, in my experience with uh, drinking with judges and uh, officials in China, uh, of course the quality of the alcohol is in question, usually in China, who's <laughs> your headache in the morning. But um, uh, the, my experience is that when, after a few glasses, they know, they know, of course they know what the rule of law is about. You know, if you ask them in China, you know, of course they know the importance of the independence of the judiciary. It is when they are engaged in official capacity that they can't talk about these things openly, uh, at least not officially. But when you get them, you know, into a private sort of uh, uh, occasion, have a few drinks, and then they'll tell you uh, that, that they believe the independence of the judiciary is key to, to the rule of law. And with the Communist Party always being the, the, the ruling party, the only ruling party controlling all three branches of the uh, power structure, then you, you, it, will, it, will be very, it will be very difficult to develop uh, the rule of law in China without an independent judiciary. I think everyone knows that. Uh, it's, it's a, 
There's the elephant in the room, which no, no, nobody wants to talk about. But that's the, the, uh, the, the way I see it now in, in China. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm actually from Taiwan. I'm very happy to join this event. And based on the experience in Taiwan, like the development of rule of law actually is based on some outside and inside factors to force the ruling party to share the power to the society. I believe they, they don't want to do that. They, they have to do some reason wish them to do that. And of course, the professor mentioned that the, the culture in China is changing. But do you see any other factors will like, make this development sooner in the future? Well, um, you're right that uh, we have internal factors and external factors. Uh, in the case of China, now for other countries, maybe the external factor may be more important, like you say, Afghanistan and Iraq, that may be the external factor that will be more important. But for China, I think developed up to this stage, the external factors will be less important. It's more the internal factors. And um, that's one thing I've uh, studied about cultural change. And the general observation that cultural change takes a long time, generations. Just uh, think about how your father sees things and how you see things are different and all your grandfather you know, I mean, um, And no matter how to talk to them, they will not change their way of thinking. Just actually, just uh, when I came out from home to here, actually I was uh, criticized by my wife, you know, you never change. <laughs> and, uh, because I was uh, kind of influenced by my, the values that I picked up at the time when I, I was young. So for those, uh, for, for, for people in China, especially those now in power. They were um, educated, so cultural change take a long time, and but your questions can it be faster. Now, another observation may not be directly related to the You can see that some um, people much older than you, and even than me, they start to use iPad. They just started to use the type of PC, a lot, and actually my my uncle seven, in, in his seventies liked his iPad very much and always uh, talk, play with us with his iPad. Again, he has downloaded all the apps I have never known. So what I say is that the internet and the information technology may change, uh, may cause the pace of change faster, but just we do not know. We just do not know. It may, in the case of China, the um, the uh, information technology may cause the cultural change faster in a much uh, into a pace that maybe we did not wait for 20 years, 10 years, even shorter. We don't know. And also history, you can see a lot of things are um, 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 kind of uh, accidents. That we do not, sometimes things just happen. We cannot predict that. If, uh, for example, a, a particular event, okay, like um, someone uh, killed himself in, in Beijing, that may suddenly cause an uproar and force the, the uh, government to accept certain change. And then change will cause further changes. So, but just that we, we don't know. So that could, that's a possibility. That's a possibility. But I think we're not, we cannot rely on this kind of uh, accident. We have to uh, work uh, on the on the basis that a change will come, but it may take time, and how we could build a better foundation. And even so, if it comes too fast, it may not be good. And that's also the experience of many countries where their culture is not ready. Even if you have to build wrong institutions, you, the, the institutions just cannot work. So I think even Taiwan has taken a long time to develop its global system, and up to now, I think it's still in the learning process. I think uh, after my angel was uh, uh, this term of office, and if he's uh, the, the Mandarin Dong, be able to take up that again. Now that's the third time of 
changing powers between the parties. Now, that helped the Taiwan people to learn further. So it takes a long time for people to learn. And I think even for, for, for Taiwan, okay? And maybe if China comes too fast, may not be a good thing. Though I hope that can be early, but sometimes getting too fast, maybe may not be too good because the people are not ready. We are talking about low students. Actually, one of the projects that I plan to do is to conduct a survey on the legal culture of the general public of Chinese people. I think even Hong Kong, general public Hong Kong people, our legal culture is actually not too satisfactory. <laughs> it, it, it matches with the global development we have achieved. So that's also another aspect why the global system in Hong Kong uh, uh, foundation may need some more improvement because of the general problems, the, how they see the interpretation issue, how they see the uh, Zhu Hai Bridge case. So you can see that. That's the, the attitude to the general public. They may not share the same kind of values as the law students, legal practitioners, lawyers. Okay? So, but we, they are the people that are actually sustaining and supporting the global system. So we, we need a, a, a cultural development up to a certain stage or an extent before we can really have a local institution. Thank you very much for the three of you for kindly sparing your time and sharing with us your thoughts on the rule of law in China. Certainly, definitely very, very useful in setting the scene for us for our coming discussions on different aspects of China. So, thank you very much once again. I'm very happy that um, Jonathan is here to present you with a souvenir. Um, if, yeah. Thank you, Rico. Thank you so much. You have been very, very helpful in helping organizing this. Thank you, Mr. Kwaki. I know that you have a very, very tight schedule, but we still gave us time very, very nicely. And thank you, Professor Tai, for your insights and your presentation. Thank you very much once again. Uh, we'll now take, I think, two, three minutes break just for you to, I don't know, refresh yourself. And. Yeah, sure. The Canadian Council are actually putting together some of these material on a block space coming on this question. We will notify you guys through the organization. Yeah, definitely.